You can okay. click on live. Okay, we are live now. Now. Okay, good evening or hello, good day, Jeff. Um, thank you for agreeing to meet up with us and thank you for all of your wholehearted support. Um, we are looking forward to your presentation. This is the first event uh, in, uh, in the horror curatorial program of the, the exhibition entitled The Entangle that has been opened two days ago. Before I introduce you, I would just like to share with the audience how I got to know more about your practice. And it was thanks to my fellow, I mean, she's also a curator, uh, Megana Karnik, who opened the delightful show at the Cleveland Art Institute. And the title of that exhibition, which opened a couple of months ago, was uh, the, the title was The Title To Be Determined. And what I loved about it, because it didn't speak from what I could see from the distance, it was not a show about the political vacuum of any kind. Uh, it was a show that aimed um, towards the new political horizon, uh, aimed towards uh, making new signifiers for the political yet to come, I would say, looking that that's just my input. So I said, wow, this is amazing because we always have a tendency to, to stick with the known niches when we project our social lives. So what if we could think uh, um, differently in terms of uh, a mutual shared space and try to find common points and not to deal in the category of an enemy all the time, but try to understand that if, if there are correlations between us. So um, that is where I've, I've seen your diagram and in a completely different context in Belgrade, Serbia, the capital of Serbia, we just realized that it fits perfectly. It's a completely different co context with uh, many antagonisms of various kinds. Maybe uh, some of these antagonisms you wouldn't even care for. Maybe some of these antagonisms you probably wouldn't be aware of, but then the diagram was something that was our mutual uh, common, which was a common point. So I thought we could translate it into Serbia, not to colonize ourselves with the imperial, imperial American, uh, American imperialism. So we did translate it and uh, it is at the entrance of our exhibition. We have both the English uh, version and the version in Cyrillic letters, uh, which is a Serbian version. But then we were curious to know more about your practice and especially in the context of many events which were very oppressive regarding some of our members and some of other members of the artistic community who represented some kind of difference and who were ostracized by more conservative members. So instead of talking about oppressors and rejections and all these kind of a heavy burden that we embody in our society. We want to see if your practice could give us an insight in a potential solution. So um, I leave the, the vir virtual agora to you, up to you, and um, we will join you later with the questions. But before, I just want to mention a couple of things about your practice. So Jeff Casper is an interdisciplinary artist, writer, organizer, educator, and designer. His primary focus is art and design as social action. He designs pathways for a trauma-informed culture shift, prototyping conflict transformation, platforms for collaboration and peer support processes through objects, tools, social spaces, and workshops. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, everyone can hear me okay? If you could put a thumbs up. <laughs> that would be great. Okay, awesome. Um, today I'm going to share slides and talk a little bit about my work and within uh, the context of this. So let's hopefully this will work. Give me one moment. <laughs> um, here we are. It'll take a moment to uh, present. All right, we, we're, we look good. Okay, so Today I'm going to talk a little bit about my work um, and under this sort of bigger category or this uh, idea of prefiguring cultures of support. Um, 
I'm going to be uh, talking about what I mean by that and how my work engages on that um, sort of topic, which I think is very re relevant to um, much of what you just shared. <clears throat> um, uh, as um, was noted, uh, I really work across categories as an artist. Um, and I think uh, the most um, clear way that I can describe what I do is really thinking about um, how to build a culture that's trauma informed in, in, in the, and what I mean by that is how do I, how can I support um, uh, communities uh, in order to uh, build more accountability between each other to build more healthy relationships? Uh, how can art be something that contributes to that? Um, and I, you know, I'll be going into this a little bit more in depth, but this experience, uh, this sort of approach that I'm, that I'm taking really is informed by um, uh, about a decade or more of arts organizing. So being a community organizer within, uh, as an artist and within spaces of art um, and working with cultural institutions, social planning um, uh, organizations and inside and outside um, formal places of learning. So within universities, but also out in communities and how to bridge those kind of gaps. Um, I'm currently also a professor at the University of Massachusetts. I'm a, a New Yorker, um, I'm from New York City, but I currently live about three hours um, uh, north of that in um, a more rural area where I'm uh, resting now <laughs> for um, uh, after being in New York City for, for my whole life. Um, so I, I'm going to be using the term trauma um, often in this presentation, and uh, I just felt it was important first to acknowledge what I mean by this. Um, there are many ways to use this term, um, and I'm sure that would also, uh, you know, vary depending on culture. Um, but the way that I define trauma uh, the, is I describe it as an event or series of events that are stressful enough to leave someone overwhelmed, helpless, or unsafe. Um, and, you know, trauma affects an individual and the way it affects an individual is dependent on so many factors. So that could be characteristics of, um, you know, individual characteristics. Um, or one's body to the, the type of event that would produce a traumatic response. Um, in addition to, you know, one's developmental processes, you know, nature, nurture, as well as um, the meaning of the trauma itself to the person or to the community, um, which of course has a lot to do and shifts and is different based on socio-cultural factors. Um, Going forward, I felt it was really important to break down what constitutes um, social practice for me. So often I am um, described or describe myself as a social practice artist uh, or a socially engaged artist, but that is a very broad term and it um, in, in some sense is not specific enough and means different things to different people. So what I wanted to talk about today is this sort of, uh, it, or in this, in, in this moment is uh, these different categories or these different approaches that I take that are, um, that constitute my work in social practice. Um, and I wanted to outline this before I kind of go deeper because it's really important to understand these approaches in order to look at my work or for me to discuss it. Um, first off is that I am a designer by training. Um, I, th I think that's the, the only profession I could really ever really claim. I've had uh, a lot of training as a graphic designer, um, as well as working within spatial design um, related to urban studies um, and uh, you know planning. Um, and that the way, the tools that design provided me, um, even though I now work outside of maybe more uh, corporate projects or commercial projects, um, the way that, you know, design really provided a framework for me to work as an artist and as a person, um, a social actor. And I really think of design as a world building tool. 
um, in the sense that the skills of design, whether employed by designers or by uh, individuals who don't would not categorize themselves as such, um, is always an act of creating something new. Um, and that that is very central to what I uh, do and, and design thinking and, and design as world building is, is really present in all of my work. And it's important to understand that. <clears throat> Another vector of the work is um, what I would call, um, which is sort of a, a three-part uh, philosophy to education. I also would say that mostly all of my work revolves around education. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, educating youth uh, or who we you know, traditionally think of as students, but thinking about education as a lifelong process and as we are all learners. Um, and the way that I approach my projects and the way they relate to education are these three kind of different philosophies that I bring together. First of all, I'm really very interested in peer-to-peer -peer education, meaning removing the expertise of the teacher and having it be um, more horizontal and from learner to learner. I'm very interested in um, indirect education and indirect commu uh, community engagement. And folks say, what do you mean indirect? That doesn't sound very good. You wanna be engaged, right? Um, you wanna be directly engaged. Well, yes, but there are different ways to do that. And my, uh, my approach um, in indirect is to create a context where learning is embedded into um, situations where you're not expecting that you're learning. Um, and, and in sense, in sense, it is sort of uh, part of everyday life or part of exceptional, an exceptional experience where you're not really necessarily going to my projects to, to be like, I'm going to learn something today, but um, it's, it's, it's embedded within the process. And lastly, within the education, I believe in public pedagogy, meaning that we cannot um, keep uh, the process of education and teaching within um, the ivory tower and we cannot, uh, we must be learning in public. Uh, and that almost all of my projects, I, I could say, fall into this category of public pedagogy where we're learning together in a horizontal fashion in a context that is not necessarily, doesn't look like a classroom and is in public, meaning we're, we're trying to bridge what we're learning inside with what's the, the world, like with a social context. Um, the next kind of category to, um, or frame in which is important to look at my work is uh, arts-based social planning. Uh, my, I would say, longest experience professionally is working as an artist uh, facilitator um, in between community organizations, whether that be NGOs or um, grassroots coalitions. Um, at, or sort of small places, community affairs, um, and working as an artist in order to use arts to either translate or add value to um, change processes that communities are seeking. And I've worked in this capacity on hundreds of projects. Um, I could talk all day about that alone um, outside of my what I would consider my formal practice of an artist being an artist and and this this experience really informs me and the work that I'm going to share today so you know having um, uh, having the experience of working with in, uh, communities who are both I am a part um, as well as communities that I am not a part and figuring out how to use arts to um, really uh, figure out what is important, um, what are important dynamics to shift around um, community affairs. And I, I've worked on projects related to housing and, uh, and urbanism. I've really I've worked on projects related to immigration, um, all different topics, <laughs> health. Um, and it's really changed the way I work as an artist in, um, as, as sort of embodying this hybrid uh, between fields like social work and, um, you know, urban planning and art. <laughs> so I live somewhere in that really strange space. Um, and it's very important to acknowledge um, in regard uh, in regards to looking at my work or discussing my work that everything I do comes from a queer survivor disability embodiment. 
in this, uh, that I won't be talking about my trauma experience, but what today, <laughs> but what I would like to uh, point out is that the ways in which I approach art making or art as social engagement cannot be separated from the fact that I have experienced, uh, experienced violence and experienced uh, traumatic events, which I continue to live with, that are directly related to my identity as a queer person. And that that produces a certain aesthetic subjectivity and approach. And my work should be also looked at in that, in that way. Um, and that is, I think, clear in some senses when I'll show examples. Um, and the last uh, really important sort of area of knowledge that my work is always engaging with is environmental psychology. I am not a clinician. I am not a psychologist. I am deeply interested in this area of knowledge, mainly because it offers certain tools that uh, I believe that uh, allow us to understand that the environment, and I mean the environment, broadly de determined, not just like the trees and the grass, but our, the spaces we live in socially and physically are both shaped by us and, sh and also shape us. Um, and that understanding that kind of agency that both the physical world and our, and ourselves um, uh, represent, we, you know, this is a really important aspect to the way that, um, you know, I create work and the way that I, you know, that folks engage with the ideas in my work. Um, and it comes from a really deep uh, field of knowledge called environmental psychology. Um, it's also really important um, for me to lay out that my work is based in a theory of change. So there are many ways and many models of change, uh, and we all likely have our own embedded in us that we may or may not even articulate. But it's really important uh, for me to discuss uh, the theory of change, which I oper I you know that I embody and that is operative in my work and in my uh, all my intentions. Um, and it is and it is this. So. I enter um, any type of change process um, really only stopping at awareness very briefly. I, I, I must, I, I, and I advocate that we must not only stay in spaces of awareness knowing that there are issues, but we must move towards action. This is very difficult. I will not <laughs> um, lie to you about that. Um, it is very easy to stay in a space of awareness. Um, in order to move towards action, I have uh, articulated this idea. Um, many, have, many have articulated this idea, but uh, in, um, in regards to my work, I think of it as um, creative engagement, which is somewhat is a, a middle point between consciousness raising, understanding that there's an issue socially and acting on it. Um, and I find that this is the, the best space for me to, uh, that I'm, this is where my role lies. Uh, this is what I'm best suited towards. And I believe that a lot of people are also suited towards this specific aspect within the chain of change. Um, and I define creative engagement as using art and design to prefigure, meaning to create before it exists and inclusive and nonviolent social relations. So in my particular practice, the way that creative engagement works is that I'm looking to reorient art making, meaning uh, move beyond my own studio practice where I'm in charge of all of the creation and move towards how can I make, even if, I, how can I make what I do, even if it involves my own artistic gestures, how can I make that participatory? And how can uh, this be something that can be used to build consciousness? Um, and in that sense, uh, you know, I describe a little bit more about the types of work that I do, which um, I did earlier and, and in the introduction, I, I'm looking and I create experiences, tools, visualizations, and, and tangible places where we can really start to prefigure the reality we would like. Um, 
uh, I want to acknowledge that this format here um, is uh, something that you can encounter in the work of More Art, which is a New York-based nonprofit, which I worked with for many years, um, and which is also in uh, documented in the book More Art in the Public Eye. I'll uh, pitch that later on uh, in the talk, but if you're interested in this, you can take a look there. Um, so creative engagement brings us to action and action must do the following for my, in my theory of change. It must transform institutions, big groups, while also adding capacity to grassroots movement, small groups. It must bring top and bottom together. Um, and this is an approach that I, uh, that is unique to my perspective. And I would say that is definitely arguable. <laughs> um, though in my work to understand my work, I'm always working within and without institutions and pushing uh, spaces together. I don't work only outside of institutions or only inside, I do both. And that is the type of thing that um, moves towards a, a potential change. Um, and I, there's going to be many diagrams, as you can tell, because I <laughs> this is the type of work I do. Um, and this was done actually by students in one of my class here uh, in, uh, in New York City. Um, and this is uh, a, a diagram of sort of what it, what it takes to engage in, in social change. And um, you'll note here uh, that you'll need consciousness, self-analysis, clear principles, recognition of, of limitations, openness, and a spirit of participa participation. Um, and really um, what, I, what is described here is how you have to move from consciousness to analysis, to engaging in the limits of what you know and working with others who know something different than you continually in order to enact social change. It's not, this is, this diagram is funny because it's kind of linear, right? But it's really a, a very circuitous um, and, and, and um, uh, fractal-like kind of uh, construction. Really, we could move you know, in many directions in this, in this way. But these are components which are immensely important. <clears throat> so moving in more specifically to the topic that I'm excited to talk more about today is um, how is this question, can we embody cultures of support by practicing what is called conflict transformation. So conflict transformation, often when I say that word, folks are like, wait, what do you mean? Conflict is, conflict is bad. We, what, why are we talking about conflict? Uh, I, I don't wanna talk about it. I wanna avoid it. Um, and that is, I would pose not the healthiest thing to do. Uh, avoiding conflict is in fact um, going to get you back into conflict. <laughs> what I would advocate for is conflict transformation. And this uh, specific definition by Lederach is um, that conflict transformation is, is basically pursues the development of change processes um, by focusing on the creative potential of difficult or negative situations. So within conflict, within this, within the ten, uh, tension of conflict, we must look for and we must leverage the potential of uh, positive or transformation, um, and that it that this sort of model encourages understanding of dynamics between individuals or between phenomena, uh, relational and structural patterns, while also. Uh, so acknowledging that those are at play and that we're embedded in them, as well as thinking about, well, how do I improve the relationships? How do I build deep relationships that are not, um, you know, based in the negative? This is immensely challenging, especially speaking personally as someone who has been involved and been the subject or victim of um, oppressive social dynamics. Um, this is this is something that we must build capacity for, especially as oppressed indi individuals. I acknowledge that, and this is um, uh, the the diagram that we are have begun our conversation about um, that I, I I put together to kind of start to understand 
um, the, uh, how would I say, uh, cycle of conflict um, to visualize it in, in order to think about how we can uninhabit this sort of continual cycle of conflict or continual, continual psych, cycle of harm um, and how we can in fact transform. And, and I will also say that there are many, um, there are many approaches to conflict transformation and there are many diagrams and there are many authors and thinkers uh, and that I, I'm very influenced by. And, you know, this is in line with, and I'll share some books later on in the talk, but just to say that, you know, a lot of this thinking has, all, and I'm also influenced by um, uh, sort of histories of harm reduction and uh, how to combat addiction, which are also very important to me personally. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about this, this um, cycle, uh, this diagram here, which I call the adaptation maintenance diagram. And it's part of um, a series that's ongoing called relational athletics. Um, and really here, what we, what we start to see is that conflict is in fact um, really a, an ecology. It's a system which we can, um, you know, repeat and continue, and we will continue, uh, or we can move outside of it, um, and we can leave it. Um, I do want to say, as I'm talking about transformation, um, which is our goal here, um, I will note that just because we, uh, if, you know, just because we move into a space of transformation doesn't mean that we will never be back in conflict. We, in fact, will and that this is, um, this is an ongoing practice. Um, what this is, in, in, you know, what's important to note is that um, it's to situate ourselves within this system in order for us to be able to uh, operate and move without, move outside of and disrupt. So conflict um, really, um, the what I would advocate for is conflict as a trigger, as a, uh, a sign for change. And we should move, once we should, before even thinking about what situations of conflict we're um, actually experience, we need to first, before thought, um, recognize conflict as a sign for change. And then as we, as we note that um, in pre-contemplation, we then start to, un we start to seek to understand what is the scope of the particular conflict that we are enmeshed in? Um, and that it is very important to be in conversation with individuals within your community and outside to really see what is the scope of the conflict which we experience, which we can't always articulate. Um, and that in order to move through the space of conflict, we also need to, con to act. And in action, there are a few, I would say, uh, choices we have, <laughs> many choices. But I think the large, the two larger sort of categories which I um, outline here are either compromise, um, which we say, which we say all the time as, oh, that sounds good. Let me, you know, I'm going to compromise like with that, and that, you know, I'm I'm going to do that in order to, um, you know just get out of this situation. Or other people say, well, I feel compromised, um, meaning that uh, they did not, um, you know, uh, that their needs were not met. And because compromise is always a dual uh, sort of two-sided um, situation, I would argue that we need to move beyond compromising only as a way of uh, acting because that may bring us back into conflict eventually, because we, you know, in the same sort of track of conflict, because we are, we haven't really addressed what our perspective, our needs were in, in, in sort of, uh, in a, uh, a way in which uh, others' needs were sort of equally considered. What I would argue is the really most important thing um, to consider in order to disrupt conflict and move into transformation is um, this uh, idea of adaptation maintenance, um, which is, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's right here. Um, 
And uh, this is, uh, in fact, exactly what my work is about. Um, if I could say that where I fit within this sort of ecology, I'm all my work is, is really revolving around this term, adaptation maintenance. And what I mean by this is, how can we practice this, this sort of uh, dynamic of getting our, building our capacity in order to recognize conflict as necessary for changing and to build personal resilience? How can we actually do that? Because the reality is, in as we're navigating this cycle, we're not always really prepared to move beyond compromise and and you know and get to transformation. We don't have the capacity to do it all the time, and that is for many reasons. So how? Can we do that? We, we need to be able to figure out ways to build capacity. And that's what my work, um, where I situate my work and where many, uh, in, uh, there are many sort of um, others who, and who also would, I would say, fit within this, this field, uh, building adaptation maintenance. So to get a little bit into um, some work I uh, recently created, uh, this is a, a a small sculpture, an etched acrylic trophy that was in the show um, mentioned earlier, um, titled TBD. Um, and this is uh, this uh, this is a, a trophy for not quite making uh, making it. A trophy for not quite accomplishing your goal. And it's kind of funny this this I uh, you know this sort of conundrum of like who gives an award for something you didn't quite achieve. But what I, I find, the, the, always come back to this sort of phrase, how long do I practice before I become is the, is the ongoing $100 million question, um, is how long do I have to engage in developing my capacity in order to really be ready? Um, and the short answer is, I can't answer that for you. <laughs> Um, but what I can talk a little bit about is my um, uh, where the my the journey of this work um, one of the origins of it was, um, and uh, I had uh, experiences uh, in the last ten years um, which um, were very damaging to me um, in in the sense that I was subject to um, violence and um, discrimination based on uh, public uh, displays of affection in uh, what I thought to be a very, um, a place that that would never happen, which is New York. Um, and I began to really not, that sort of sent me on a spiral personally, of course, and emotionally and psychologically, but um, it also, put me on this sort of uh, track of figuring out if I was alone in this kind of experience, which, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, no, of course you're not. But when you're living through um, a traumatic and um, harmful situations, you're not necessarily rationalizing. Um, so the way that I started to build capacity for myself was to meet other men who had similar experiences. And I started to make, um, in conversation with other people who are, who I mainly met uh, through the internet and, you know, meeting anonymously, um, was uh, I started to make artwork and uh, the beginning of tools to think about building resilience. And this was one um, early, drawing a graphic where I was trying to describe what it would be like to hold another person, another man's hand um, uh, in public and what the different gestures might look like if I could actually achieve that. Um, and this was sort of an early sort of processing of that. All right. <laughs> so we're gonna switch uh, sort of gears a little bit and um, and talk about sort of this big, this big idea of um, an oppressive male-dominated 
patriarchal society in which um, I live definitely. I don't know about everybody else, but um, I'm definitely <laughs> enmeshed in that. And I started to think about as I uh, began to heal more through building community um, with other queer folks who had similar uh, trauma stories, I started to think about uh, the kind of conundrum that I both loved this idea of a uh, male dominated oppressive society it may be ex exemplified by things like wrestling um, and the sort of spectacle of it. But I also felt that it that that needed to be completely subverted and that it it really couldn't I couldn't uh, continue, um, uh, you know, sort of sit, you know, <laughs> allowing for this kind of culture to um, to be um, something that I didn't comment on or try to subvert. So. Um, I, I one day um, in my studies, oh. <laughs> uh, one day in my studies, um, as I was really starting, I was watching wrestling, my family members were wrestlers and I was like in the books and I was looking all, you know, all about like, um, you know, all my environmental psychology uh, interests. And I really just came across this diagram, um, which is uh, here um, uh, for uh, the field of proxemics, which is the, this, which I use a lot in my work now, um, which is um, the study of interpersonal communication as it relates to space. Um, and I was just taken aback by the similarities between the proxemic structure the, how we move from spaces of intimacy to public space and how that's all mapped to actual distances, not just sort of symbolic distances, but like intimacy is a certain distance where publicness is another distance. I started to think about, well, there's a really big similarity formally between this and the wrestling map. <laughs> um, I don't know if designers of wrestling mats think about this, but um, I felt it was very interesting. So here uh, in this area is actually a diagram of wrestling mats, sort of really very similar visually, and also um, in terms of the way that it's organized, um, these are different concentral cir concentric circle and the distances between them. Um, also, there are a lot of parallels visually. Um, so I started to really dive deep into this idea of um, what constitutes, um, um, how can I start to think about conflict um, and negotiations between relationships uh, within different distances um, and how the visual poetry of these, of these forms uh, are very much so, I, how I can bring together um, a very, uh, you know, so a formal, the form of sort of this athletic wrestling, a pr you know, sort of symbol, symbol is a symbol of sort of, sort of oppressive dominant uh, uh, culture with um, really understanding the dynamics between individuals as we are negotiating t uh, conflict um, between in, in the sort of these spaces of intimate space which is um, about up to 18 inches. It's not that long. It's like <laughs> to personal space, which is our immediate bubble of safety. Um, and this is a work, Wrestling Embrace, which is um, was in exhibition titled TBD and has traveled a bit um, and continues to be used in different contexts. And I um, developed this as a tool for workshops um, in order to uh, bring people together in a diagrammatic space where they can really explore um, the, the sort of tensions at these specific distances and practice conflict um, in a space uh, outside of um, uh, maybe everyday life. And uh, what, I, what I began to do is develop tools um, that uh, help individuals to kind of see uh, the different dynamics at play when we're um, negotiating um, in relationships. Um, how do we move beyond competition and be accommodation and into collaboration? Um, and, and as I mentioned, sort of my sort of interest in education and indirect education, this is one way in which um, folks are able to work 
um, with games and tools in um, a sort of safe spaces in order to kind of really understand um, dynamics of conflict that would play out in their lives. So I often hold workshops or exhibitions or social spaces where um, I provide tools and individuals come either alone and work with strangers or come with someone that they really um, would like to uh, have a kind of a deep experience with. Um, and you can see sort of the topic here, the sort of uh, prompt for this particular card um, around uh, accepting conflict. Uh, and what I do is try to develop, break down more complex information that we may encounter in fields like uh, in psychology or in art therapy or in health and put, bring them into a space of uh, um, a non-clinical uh, space, a space where we can experience um, different aspects of, of relational dynamics. Um, so in the back of every uh, card is a, as a symbol here, a knot, um, which uh, represent a different kind of category of engagement uh, or non-engagement from everywhere from avoiding confrontation to prioritizing touch. Um, and these uh, are, um, you know, brought together uh, in a sort of, this is one work as a, as a tools for social engagement, I would say. <clears throat> and I'm really, you know, interested in how I can provide spaces for individuals to, to really practice support, pr practice and understand that we really will encounter conflict and harm and how do we move through it. Um, so from that experience, I uh, began to uh, really articulate more. I, so I always, I would I say the mo sort of more, the constant thing about my artistic practice when someone hears that I'm an artist, they say, oh, like, what do you do? You're a painter? And I say, no, actually, the only thing I could definitely say I do is I hold a lot of workshops. I think workshops are my main media. <laughs> Um, and understanding that I began to realize that there were limitations to the space of the workshop itself and that I wanted to create environments as well that, um, that individuals can, can practice um, conflict as well as um, uh, uh, solutions. So this is an example of um, a, a space um, and here's another one recently um, geared more towards um, college age folks. Um, and I'm really, I, I really like that my work can, can become kind of a, a learning space. It's kind of like a resource center um, and that, uh, you know, individuals who are in relationships can actually come and, and like be together um, and especially individuals who are queer um, and really don't get the resources to talk about um, relational <laughs> relationships, frankly, um, even in the United States. Um, that this can be a place for them. And that it's really important that um, that work should be embedded in all sorts of contexts. This is um, an example of uh, my work at a nightclub. So can actually, um, you know, cite your, your, your projects in places where people are least likely to know to, to sort of know that they're going to engage with art or learning and uh, in maybe places that are you know even more uh, uh, impactful. Um, so I think you know uh, in particular for me um, as a queer man, you know nightlife is really important um, space in uh, New York City at, at least I can speak towards a, a space of community building but it's also a really big space where a lot of um, conflict and traumatic situations are perpetuated. Um, so embedding, embedding these tools in places that um, where they can ultimately promote um, more relational literacy um, uh, is, is a strategy. Just wanted to show. And I'm also, I'm really very much so interested in places that are comfortable. <laughs> so there's often, I build beds and soft, um, you know, environments where uh, people can come and go. And again, I always am, even when I do work in an exhibition form, um, 
and outside of like a classroom kind of dynamic. I am always trying to figure out how do I make someone feel like they want to learn something outside of their um, comfort zone. So I'm heading towards the end of, of what I wanted to, to talk to you about today, but I, I felt it was really important to um, really provide some uh, other resources and um, things that I think about that you may or may not have heard about before. Um, a really important framework for understanding um, conflict transformation uh, in, uh, is a framework called transformative justice. Um, and transformative justice is an area of um, developing expertise primarily created by queer femme uh, people of color uh, and trans and disabled people of color as well. Um, and transformative justice um, is a, an approach to addressing acts of harm that rely on community instead of the state. Um, and it's an alternative to uh, police, uh, a police sort of policing um, as we know it in contemporary life. Um, and all transformative justice models reject um, the criminal justice system and instead um, work towards building support networks that cultivate violence prevention while also acknowledging that violence will occur and we will both be the subject and the arbiters of violence and how do we heal and be accountable and move towards safety that do not rely on punishment alone and state-based violent um, approaches. Um, it's a really, this is a framework which I am a student of and which, uh, you know, undergird the type of um, sort of work towards developing adaptation maintenance that I that I'm involved in. Um, I, I I would not be able to really articulate my work without transformative justice, and that I do very much so align with this type of philosophy. So I really recommend individuals to learn a little bit more about transformative justice. And there are are people around. Um, mm -hmm the world who are uh, are leading the way along this uh, path. Wherever you are, there is someone who is looking towards that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and within transformative justice, um, so this is a, 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 a graphic by the Transformative Justice Collective in Berlin. And um, really an important aspect of um, the, of transformative justice is this idea of community accountability and how do we build a community accountability process or culture this is something that i that is a component of conflict transformation that is very important um, in some senses we need to figure out how do we provide safety and support for ourselves but also for each other it must be in dialogue with it others how do we um how are we going to move towards transforming political conditions outside of cultures of violence um, that address community members' abusive behaviors while also um, creating a process for them to account for their actions and transform their behavior? So there needs to be values and practices which are both healing for the victim as well as restorative for the those who are, um, you know, creating harm or those who are oppressing, oppressive, and that is um, that is in fact a very uh, revolutionary type of thinking. Um, I always like to shout out um, individuals who are doing this work uh, much better than I am, <laughs> and who you should look at. Um, and this is um, a tool called pod mapping. Um, and it's it was developed by the Bay Area Transform Justice Collection um, and the activist Mia Mingus. Um, and 
I recommend you to take a look at pod mapping and um, as a tool to think about um, what are the ways in which um, we develop our own networks of support. So if you can imagine here um, that you're in the center, this gray circle, who would be immediately around you who you would call on if either A, you committed harm or B, you were the subject of harm? Who would be those individuals? Me moving even further, who would be individuals that you would call on but you, that you're not quite sure are your supporters yet? Who are people who can move within a space of support, but you have to have more conversations and to build your and build your capacity to be in relation with each other? And lastly, what are the institutions, groups, larger categories, places of worship, community centers that are also places that you can go for support? If they don't exist, what are the places you need to build? So there's um, many <laughs> authors to look at and I, I wanted to share some, some books here. Um, Beyond Survival, which talks a lot about transformative justice, we give in um, tangible um, uh, experiences and examples of the practice. Um, Pleasure Activism, um, which uh, is written by Adrienne Marie Brown, who's a social justice facilitator, and it talks about the importance of us to consider pleasure as we move towards change, and to think about pleasure broadly, and not just kind of the funny way we think about pleasure. Um, and Healing Resistance um, uh, uh, by Kazuhaga, which is a uh, meditation on um, a deep sort of understanding of, uh, of nonviolent approaches to harm. Um, and this is very much so uh, grounded in the work of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, of course, I wouldn't be um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be a good artist if I didn't also say that a lot of my resources uh, that I work with in my workshops and social spaces and my social engagement work are available for free. You can go to um, the CUNY Center for Humanities and download um, actual frameworks, um, and there are uh, articles about uh, some of the topics I talked about a little bit today. Um, so that is something that's uh, freely accessible. Um, I also, you also, if you are working with or are a student of art, um, I created um, research called Critique as Support, which talks about um, peer-to-peer -peer support, building networks of peer-to-peer -peer support um, within uh, spaces of learning. Um, I'm looking at the American context specifically um, as an American educator, but I, uh, I think there are a lot of um, crossovers with the way that we learn and engage in art, uh, learning about art and becoming artists that are maybe applicable um, to many people in, in, outside of the United States. And you can get that um, at titletbd.show and that's a free download um, as well. I'm very interested in um, uh, making my work free. I am working on a larger book called Critique as Support, um, which has more than what's available in this workbook. Um, and that should be out a couple of years, but please take a look at that. And um, I'm, always, uh, I'm always welcoming um, uh, leading workshops on this topic specifically. Um, coming out um, in January is uh, my first monograph workbook um, with the operating system. And it um, condenses some of the tools that I've been using in my, um, and it contextualizes a lot of my thinking about proximity, trauma, disability, um, conflict transformation um, within the context of the pandemic specifically. Um, I, I will say that I have uh, not, I never anticipated that my work would, uh, which deals with proximity and touch would be directly challenged by a global event like the pandemic. Uh, so it was a great time to reflect on um, uh, four or five years of work um, and think about it when we can't actually touch. 
Um, so I'm, that's an ongoing um, development. Um, and if you're interested in um, uh, more about uh, the work of social engaged art, this is a book I just published earlier this year, um, which uh, talks a bit about, uh, which really is a case studies of many artists work, which um, some of which I supported um, others um, as a facilitator and, and other facilitators as well, and really uh, gives you a broader um, context of socially engaged art through the lens of one particular organization that supports it in New York City. So um, you can get a, a deeper sense of some of my, um, where my kind of background comes, uh, comes, it, comes from. <laughs> um, and that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff. This was uh, extremely beneficial to the, the situations that we are um, experiencing right now in Belgrade. Uh, but first of all, as a human being, I would like to acknowledge the fact that uh, even though you were you went through a trauma, you're capable of transforming it. Uh, I empathize with the fact that you went through a trauma and I, and I know how hard it is to talk about it because a traumatized person cannot easily um, speak up. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, it can be easily trans translated into an artistic practice that other could benefit from. So, um, so uh, it's a huge uh, acknowledgement of, of that effort that you have put into your practice. Um, on the other hand, um, what I see now and um, your art artistic practice is so much different from the practices that uh, we've been not we, uh, when I, I say we, the, the dominant, the hegemony of the art world was dealing with different kinds of practices. But would you say, I just, it's just a comment and a question as well. Would you say that uh, in the future we will need much more of this kind of art and these kind of practices, empathic and um, systematic, uh, that uh, empathic in a sense that, and systematic in a sense that maps out a different kind of system and acknowledges other beings and differences? Well, I, I don't think I'd be a, a good um, socially engaged artist to say that <laughs> if I said no, but I definitely think it's very important that, um, that artists work um, in the expanded field and that doesn't eclipse or um, say that any other sort of a, a, uh, artistic um, production is not valid. That is completely untrue. What I, what I would like to see and what I am seeing is that more artists are working in outside the spaces of, of art in order to really re-embed art within the space of politics and change. This is where it should belong, um, you know, in my uh, frame of view. So I do think it is very important um, and I think artists are important because they really do provide um, alternative futures to the world we live in. Um, whether that is within the space of a canvas or within a room or within um, a, you know, an environment in conflict. Um, so I think it's really important for artists, uh, regardless of their practice, to understand that um, responsibility that one has um, in producing um, culture. Amazing. But if, I would like to encourage the audience to uh, raise a hand and uh, ask you some questions. But in the meanwhile, I would like to read a comment from one of the members of the association who is currently based in Los Angeles. And he says, his name is Vojslo Radovanovic. And in the comment section, he says, great presentation. Thank you for providing all these interesting tools and better understanding of your artistic practice. So um, yeah. So if anyone would like to ask a question, uh, I don't know, just maybe you can, you can uh, tell us in a comment or uh, uh, write down the, the question in the comment um, section or just tune in or unmute yourselves and um, if not I just you know Claire Bishop she wrote a lot about the the per artificial hell uh, of the participatory art and do you what do you have any angle on that or maybe mm. 
the dif what's the difference that you produce or um, I mean because uh, yeah, participatory yeah. art has been around for a long time but to me I think this comes from a different origin your artistic practices of a different origin it, it's much more genuine because uh, it seems to me because uh, you went to, through a trauma yourself and this is a process of healing that you have uh, that you went through and uh, that um that informed your practice uh, from the inside you know i think we get out stronger from the traumatic experiences right and then uh, so if you have any I, i'm sure you you um you there were some meeting points between uh, the artificial health uh, book the yeah. angle of Bishop. Yeah, I think I think it's um, really important to for me to you know acknowledge exactly what you said, which is I do think that there are different origins uh, to the type of work that I do, and artists who work like me um, are what they're doing, and that we're coming from an embedded um, situation of engaging with the world from our positionality um, and our communities and how that's linked to other dynamics. And that, um, and that produces a certain aesthetic and a certain sensibility that I think is um, kind of on a different trajectory. Um, but I think what, where I find um, important sort of connection with that kind of framework is that um, I, I do believe that we're living in a moment where we are not, uh, where we're sort of seeing a crisis of uh, democratic ideals. Um, and that is very, uh, and democratic processes. And in that sense, um, artists are responding through the media of participation in order to rethink and actually, like I would mention, pre prefigure um, new forms of democratic engagement, which I think is very much so um, uh, in line with what you know, uh, what what Bishop studies. Um, so I think there are crossovers in that sense. But one of the things for me, and I studied at uh, City University, and so Bishop is one of the professors. <laughs> um, and um, I would definitely say that there's a whole trajectory of community-based and activist art um, that I feel like um, does not get mapped within the discourse of contemporary art. And um, I would recommend folks to, you know, look at the, the writing of um, uh, Gregory Shalette, who is, was my teacher. Um, that's, uh, you know, he's very much so looking towards um, the histories of activist art even though it might not look like activism um, and, and, and how that doesn't always make its way into the mainstream contemporary art. And I, I will say like, I have the opportunities to work within contemporary art and outside of it. And I really wouldn't have any other way. I, don't, I think that it's very important for me to be involved in spaces where um, I can be engaging with individuals who this work impacts directly. Um, so, and I think that artists who are interested in doing that should be comfortable in working outside of kind of the, the spaces of contemporary art that are kind of more legible. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, and meanwhile, we have um, one question from Voice Radovanovic and the, the, the LA based artist and he says, what is your specific experience of doing workshops with different age groups? Does your methodology change uh, in that way? That's a great question. So I have worked both, I've really worked on almost every age group. I would say the earliest is probably middle school, um, uh, middle school all the way to adults to seniors. <laughs> um, and I think workshops take different forms based on where you know, for me, based on where um, they're happening, you know, a workshop for 30 minutes in a classroom is going to take a different format than uh, a two day intensive with, um, you know, people in my community. Um, so I, I, you know, 
I think there's always an adaptation, a change to the format and the content, um, regardless, regardless of where, you know, regarding where I'm working. Um, so it definitely does change, but I'm still very much so um, dedicated to this idea of peer to peer and indirect teaching. And that is not something I forego, even if I'm working with younger individuals. I, I find that I'm always situating myself as a facilitator, um, even at younger age groups, which is very jarring for younger generations um, in the sense that they're used to being, we're used to receiving knowledge, like an individual is like lecturing to them um, and they are taking in. I am very interested in creating hierarchies where um, learners are the experts of their process of learning and that I can provide resources and, and spaces of connection, but ultimately um, it is up to them. And that's very difficult to do, I would say for any educators here. <laughs> um, because, and especially for younger folks, because they're not expecting to take control of what their learning experience is like. But I argue, and the reason why I'm very steadfast in this approach is that I think that that's necessary. Um, that's an, an that's a necessary component to being an active, engaged member of society. Is that you're going to eventually need to do that kind of um, work socially, uh, you know, as an individual. So, though there are many teachers who do this work that are more lecturers and um, you know have different formats, I think my the value of this kind of approach is to offer. Um, a way for people to build knowledge on their own terms um, and that I can kind of be like a DJ <laughs> to help. <laughs> Thank you. We have another question from uh, Nanet Kostic who is a collector, uh, who is a Belgrade based collector. And maybe he can, he would like to ask the question openly, like not in the comments, but just like Nanet. Yes, um, uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Am I audible? Yes. You are. Yeah. <clears throat> I have two uh, one sentence questions. I missed the first two or three minutes of your presentation. Uh, I joined when you were talking about trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, did somebody um, advise you to take up art uh, for a therapeutic reason? Nope. <laughs> Uh, then can you tell us briefly how your art practice changed uh, with the trauma? How was it before and how was it afterward? Mm -hmm. That's really good. So I was always very interested in um, the spatial and organizing um, information about how we relate to space and how um, it impacts us. And I had done many walking and, and uh, mapping based projects um, and still, you know, do that. And then, you know, as I was really involved in that and as I met this sort of moment of having to reconstitute my own self after a traumatic situation, I started to realize that my body and my nervous system, my experience was directly linked to the environment that I was very interested in studying kind of objectively. And that trauma actually really, um, you know, that wasn't, <laughs> it's hard to say in this way, but an opportunity very much so to acknowledge, situate myself personally within the social uh, without having to, and acknowledging that I can't look at things objectively like I did earlier in my practice. So in some sense, even though it, it took a long time to sort of be able to articulate that, the traumatic situation very much so um, impacted my uh, understanding of being social, <laughs> of being a social being. Um, so because I was literally, um, you know, uh, that was taken from me. Uh, so I had to reconstitute it. And I think that's, yeah, that's how I would respond to that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? Um, so um, 
you know, because we are experiencing different um, different situ different traumas so all over again uh, in Belgrade. And uh, I think it's extremely important that we, we manage to get to know more about your methods of survival and adaptation to trauma and uh, what's going on. And I think what I learned from your lecture, I learned many things, but I, what I would like to emphasize and re-emphasize would be uh, the, the, the creative engagement as a potential within the institution of art, uh, then addressing the oppressor and uh, trying to not to hide from the conflict, but try to uh, understand how we can um, use the conflict for the transformation and how we have to be uh, aware of the fact that the transformation might not always lead to a complete heaven on earth, but maybe uh, we will fall into conflicts again. But what was also extremely important that you, uh, the, the, the term and the practice that you have in, introduced of transformative justice, when the state justice is slow, I think that we as, as a community, we have to build up and um, our strengths uh, apart from the, the, the official justice system and to try to uh, support the individuals who feel fragile uh, and, um, and who feel threatened uh, from, the part, from the part of the oppressors. So um, I'm grateful for this input of yours. I'm grateful for your participation in the exhibition. And uh, if there are no more questions, um, we can close this session and meet you on another occasion. And um, I hope that you will adjust to the proper distance amidst the COVID situations and the social injustice that are happening all over uh, the, earth, the planet Earth. But yeah, uh, we will grow stronger, right? Yes, absolutely. Art, art, will, art, art will help us to grow stronger. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Jeff. All the best of luck. Bye, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for taking part in this session. I find it extremely important. We have to build communities that are supportive and that uh, believe in, uh, in a better society.